more pictures up here. Anyway, we're just waiting for um, people to um, arrive at the, at the webinar today. So there's a quick poll on screen for you. If you'd be interested in filling that in, that would be really, really helpful. Um, and we'll give people a couple of minutes to get in. Mm -mm. Oh. Somebody's phone's gone off. <laughs> if you've just joined us, we're just giving people a couple of minutes to get in and then we'll there's a poll on screen, a quick poll if you're currently using iPad and learning. Can you just complete that please? That'd be really helpful. There's a number of different handouts um available to you through GoToWebinar. You'll find them in the handout section if you want to find it a little bit more. And you can have a look at those. And um, we'll start in just a minute. Okay, Gina, do you want to move on? Shall we get started? Is that us? Ready to go? Okay. Go Hi there, everybody. Um, my name is Michael Conlon, and um, I'm my colleague, Lee Milligan. Um, hello, hello. Uh, so welcome, everyone, to this special seminar for senior leaders and leaders of learning. Um, we're going to explore today the impact the iPad can make for learning and teaching, especially in an environment of distance learning. It's really, really important to you that you have confidence in this area, given that you'll be planning for the new normal um, in the coming years, a blended learning model that mixes home and school-based activities. So I'm just going to move over on to my uh, presentation just now. I'll show the main screen if we can get that up and running. Hopefully you can all see that. Uh, to start the presentation would be useful. And there we go. Hopefully we can you get a chance to see that. So we also want to support senior leaders in developing their understanding of why iPad can deliver on your learning and teaching strategy. You know you'll be seeking to transform what you're going to be doing. And we know that our current predicament has exposed you know a digital access gap and uh, perhaps a lack of consistency across student devices that are out there. There are challenges around security when pupils are using their own personal devices, which I know we'll be concerned about. And there's the shared nature and the functionality of some family devices. You know, the 
family of five, for example, that I know with one device to cover all learning and working needs, that's a real challenge. Um, Education is always changing, and that's been accelerated, obviously, by COVID-19. And the senior leaders, you need to ensure that you've got a resilient and a sustainable model for education delivery. We know that young people need to make progress in learning and not just consolidation. They need to continue to develop new skills and be connected to their peers and to their teachers. And of course, we want to try and get the benefits of technology, and we'll explore some of that this afternoon to leverage it to improve student engagement, attention, attendance, behaviours, things like that. So we'll just start off with an introduction to ourselves, really. Um, my background as Michael Conlon, uh, I'm a transformation consultant for XMA and an Apple professional learning specialist. And what I do is I'm here to guide and advise schools and local authorities really through the art of the possible in their establishments, uh, developing a vision and a planning, planning a route through change. My background is senior leadership in secondary, uh, quality improvement and digital learning at local authority level, and also working as part of the digital learning team nationally at Education Scotland. And so today I've got my um, senior leader head on, if you like, and so I'm going to look at my school improvement plan, thinking about what it means to me for the next five years, and wanting to take a closer look at real change. Um, over to Lee. Hi, uh, yeah, so you can tell that this looks very different from that photo. <laughs> I think that's lack of hairdressers in uh, these times. But yeah, I'm Lee Milligan, and I lead up the digital learning team for XMA up in Glasgow. And I started off in finance. And then I retrained as a modern languages teacher, a secondary teacher rather, and I've worked in various local authorities, both in private and the public sector. And I suppose I bring up my experience of working in industry because it really helped me understand what employers are looking for. And I've always aimed to design those learning experiences for all my students so that they are not only learning languages, but they're learning skills, which will set them up for life. And some of those we'll be looking at today, the obvious, the obvious one being digital learning, um, but also collaboration, communication, critical thinking and choice. So I suppose I bring to this we webinar the perspective of the teacher, uh, the principal teacher, and when working with staff and students, it is so key to create and encourage that and, and nurture that kind of culture of curiosity, growth mindset and innovation. So yeah, no one's afraid to try out new things and they don't think they're failing. Um, they're just really trying out new things. Um, we know that exams are really important, but if we encourage resilience and growth mindset in our staff, as well as our students, then we're providing these tools so everyone can get through those kind of stressful times. Um, and this all comes from a um, really clear vision. Um, and this is something that I'm really passionate about as an Apple professional learning specialist. I really enjoy working with educational establishments listening to and seeing all the different visions, the different cultures, the different environments. And I think Michael is going to show us some of the key resources which the XMA learning team use all the time and they are available. There we go. And I'm going to come off camera now. Hey, there we go. So I'll come off camera too. Uh, so let's have a look at some of these resources. I'd like to start with bringing your attention some some of the resources that are going to support your ambition and help you understand the approach that Apple take in transforming uh, education from leadership to pedagogy and beyond. So at XMA, our Apple professional learning specialists will engage with you as you begin your exploration of iPad. Now, all of the books I'm going to show you are freely available on the Apple bookstore in the education section. They're really engaging, interactive, and I was saying to somebody earlier, they're really efficient. You know, they're not padded out with things that eat up your time and don't offer you anything in your understanding. It's not endless pages of candy floss, for example. It's just really solid content. So first up is a series of books that demonstrate how to lead change in your establishment using Apple as an ecosystem, developing innovation and leadership and teaching, perhaps engaging with research opportunities within your school as part of a professional inquiry. Um, and also have a deep understanding of how to push the technology for those elements of learning that deliver successful lessons. Um, and I know some of you will be wanting to hear about other schools that have perhaps done it already. So there's a whole series of books on the education store that demonstrate how to lead um, your school through that. So they're all developed by Apple Distinguished Schools, and every ADS has to publish a record of their journey from the vision to the impact they're having um, in the school, using it as a key pillar 
in the life and ethos of those schools. I'm a big fan of uh, Leighton Primary. Shout out to them in Blackpool, St Cyrus School in Wales, and the Ferris Academy. And there's a whole host of, of, of things out there that you really get an awful lot of benefit from. View stories from real head teachers and senior leadership teams. I, I just explore those. Next up, Apple have built an entire curriculum around creativity across four key areas, the music, art, um, photography and video. I'm going to take a closer look at those and why that's a critical resource for you, especially in distance learning. Similarly, we're going to look at the Everyone Can Code curriculum that develops real life coding skills for our young people. So all of that's to come, lots of things to look, be excited about, but I'm going to start off with accessibility because I know that this was a passion of mine when I was back as a senior leader. And from a management point of view, I know our schools invest so much into support for learning strategies and staffing, but what I think is a common picture across the UK is being an increasing number of young people with identified additional support needs, but not necessarily an equivalent package of support, financial support to meet that need. And even though I can give support in school as best I possibly can, in a blended and remote learning scenario, what am I to do? I can't have students struggling at home without the same kind of support they would have had when they're in the school. I can't allow it to happen. So maybe what you want to, to, to discover is how I can leverage Apple technology to empower young people to take charge of meeting their own needs, that they become, with the use of technology, their own support for learning. And it's also a responsibility too, isn't it, to, to move away from developing any sense of learned helplessness. You know, we want to activate that instinct of theirs to be in control of their own future. And what we found, I know Leo agrees, that XMA, when the number of students and schools we work with is, you meet a lot of students who only discover their learning challenge when they've been shown a solution to it. And I know that many of the accessibility features being used by staff and pupils alike who have got no identified need. They, those tools just become a universal support. And I think Lee's going to mention something in and around that. So um, I'm going to just show you a quick um, thing that I really love um, in the accessibility features. It's got its own special place in the settings menu, and it covers vision, physical and motor skills and hearing issues and things. We can't possibly go into all of those today, but I'm going to tackle the, some of the things around, around spoken content. I can actually get the device to speak any text I select or speak the screen. Um, I know for some of our EEL students um, who like to hear words being spoken to them, there's different languages you can speak and hear voices from, but there's also features for typing feedback so that when you're typing on the screen, you can hear that word spoken back to you when you press that space bar. That's incredibly powerful. Think about the students you have who struggle with reading, who are about to you know, kick off because you've set them up a task that involves lots of reading. This can really support them. So let's look at some highlighting of some text here. And I'm going to get it to speak to us, hopefully. Discover a collection of expert how-to videos, apps and books for working and learning at home. And that's a universal support. We could all use that, couldn't we, for any document or any piece of writing on the screen, just get it read out to you. I thought you'd also like to see this. Um, it's a French newspaper. Let's have a listen to what that sounds like. Je, c'était film, dit long métrage sur le monde du tennis pour attendre Roland Garros. Very nice. I've got no idea what it means, but um, <laughs> Lisa, a modern language teacher, she'll explain to you how good or bad or indifferent that, that speech is. But what it really does is empower young students to move away from having to have a reader to read things out to them, to them taking control of that themselves and move on with the learning at their pace. Um, Leah, I know you've got some things you want to share with us. Yeah, so when I think of accessibility, I always think back to those times when I was teaching and some of my pupils would either come late to class or, I don't know if it was worse or better, they would come to class and then they'd go away again because they needed to go to the support for learning base to get a laptop. And this was kind of already putting them at a disadvantage and not exactly building confidence. So getting iPads was a total game changer, um, not just for them, but for the whole class. So that what, there wasn't that interruption all the time. And I love that we can all benefit from the variety of tools and features which are just part and parcel of the iPad and out of the box. You don't need a different app. You don't always even need to go into the settings to activate a feature. Everyone can benefit from the tools on the iPad because everyone works and learns in different ways. 
And a great example, what you can see up on the screen there, is Reader View in Safari. There's a, an increasing amount of websites now that have got Reader View. All you have to do is look out for that icon at the top. It kind of flashes up quickly, and then you can see the AA. And you know that you can enable different fonts. And I think I've got a little video there. Um, if Michael could put that on. Font sizes. So there's um, news round there. Used it the other day. Looking for a reader view at the top there. And if I just tap on it, then I can see that I can make my um, I can make my um, fonts larger, my screen larger rather, my text larger. Can't speak. I can also change the font. Um, Cerevex a really good one. But there's a whole there's a whole host of them, and I can also ch change the background. Okay, it's not an overlay as such, but it just takes that glare away, um, which all of us need. You know, that's not specific to um, anyone who's got uh, additional learning support needs. Um, as Michael has shown, there are an incredible selection of accessibility tools. I love the spoken content feature, the different voice and accents. The French accent is very good, the German one too. Um, you just have to adjust the speaking rate and activate the speak screen. And my own kids use it as well. As well, spoken content display and text size is what you can see here. It's another great tool which can be personalized for each learner. And it takes away that unnecessary anxiety and embarrassment. No one should be embarrassed, but kids do feel embarrassed when they've got something different. My niece is one of them, and she used to have to wear specialist glasses. She still has them, but with an iPad, she can use this feature, um, and she doesn't need to put those glasses on or take out that overlay. You know, I could go on. One last one. I've got one last video. There is guided access. It's another fabulous tool which I, as a parent, love. Um, I also work a lot with early years establishments and child development officers. Love seeing how this guided access, just by putting it on can lock their learners into a specific app. And they know that they can't stray or start tapping on settings or any other apps on the iPad. The iPad is just such a powerful tool. But as I say all the time, you just need to go in and try out some of these tools and see which one works for you and your learners to make all your lives a little bit easier. So there we go. We're just going to Safari there. We've put guided access on, it's on. I'm going to, I can go into it, there you go. So I've got different options in guided access. I can have a time limit as well, which is really handy. Um, I could even, I think you heard a little boop boop before. I can even have a little alert so that my learner goes, oh, wait a minute, my time's almost up. I use this with my kids too. Um, start it, that's it on. And you can just see that when I triple click, I can't get over unless I put that passcode in. So yeah, you can. And that's that, that. that's for all, for everybody, is it for parents to know that they can yep. lock their children into a specific app for a certain amount of time? Yeah. If you've got some sensory challenges in schools, I know that you know um, many students we've come across with sensory overload um, issues. Keeping them focused into an app is really useful. That whole reader view really strips away a lot of the noise that they see in the websites. That's incredibly important. If you look at the BBC News website, for example, it's got loads of content and distractions. Let's remove that and just focus on the story. It's, it's really, really powerful. Um, I now want to move on to communication and collaboration. And I've, I've called that skills for life, learning and work, which is really what we're trying to develop for, for young people. Necessity is a mother invention. We say that a lot. So that's really been proved substantially over the last few months. Teachers and leaders and pupils and parents have all had to get to grips uh, with remote learning and technology. And there's been lots of challenges here. There's lack of devices we've spoken about before for many families and young people. And there's lots of effort being put into equity of access with data plans and stuff, and that's to be commended. But as a leader, I need to know that I've got a consistent approach to remote learning, where everyone's got access to the same tools as each other. And we know that with infection control and sharing of resources being a no-go area at the moment. So if I can give my students a really powerful toolbox that's just bursting with everything they'll need. I'm absolutely going to start on that journey for, for everyone. Always, I'm always going to want to do that. I mean, I know we get sick of online meetings probably just now and, and hundreds of webinars, but we've proven that there's no need to get people to drive to one location to have a two-hour conversation. You know, it's just it's not necessary. The power that sits in the iPad and the, the cameras, the two cameras, remember, you get there, which is phenomenal. Um, the fact that you can pull any one of the tools that, that's there, including FaceTime, to communicate across distance, to teach across distance, is really, really powerful. I remember when I used to have case conferences for children 
formal agency meetings. There would be people missing in that meeting that I needed to be there. And it may be because they couldn't travel because of travel issues or they couldn't find a, a slot in the day to do the travel, the meeting and then the travel back. Using this technology, using those kind of online collaboration, just think of the time I know I'm going to be saving um, as a leader and the participation rates we'd see to meet the needs of children and young families that we're, that we're wanting to do. And we know that iPads get the best quality camera and sound out there on any device. It doesn't really matter what tool you want to use. Um, you can do it all on the iPad. So there's a whole suite of tools. I know, I know uh, Lee's going to jump in and, and talk about those, Lee. Yep, stop talking. Um, I only have to think of kind of Holyrood Secondary. You're talking about, you know, having to kind of go for miles to get to, um, you know, another meeting. So Holyrood Secondary, all in one campus, but it's the largest school in Scotland with over 2,000 pupils, I think, and 150 teaching staff. And we helped them roll out their iPads, and there was a lot of running about from one end of the school to the other. I mean, it could take you half an hour. So the idea that you can now communicate with a colleague, a teacher, or a learner at one end of the school to share your screen, share a document just quickly and easily, something that would maybe take two minutes to do. You don't now need to, you just, you know, phone that person up, um, use Teams, use whatever facility, using that camera, um, using Zoom, and it makes more sense than having that that walk for half an hour to go and just have that little chat. I think it's, it's really, really powerful. Although, yeah, I did have good step counts on those days I was there. Um, the iPad has been really invaluable during this rather challenging time. My own children have been using Google Classroom and Seesaw to communicate and share their learning with teachers. And although these are third party apps, they work really seamlessly on the iPad. And because of the choice of the features and the intuitive nature of the iPad, my kids really feel empowered to learn at their own pace. And they don't have to keep asking me about uh, a task because the technology, they don't understand how the technology is working. Usually it's because they don't know what the task is, okay? Tools such as screen recording here and then screenshot and markup allow for thinking to be made visible and that learning to be flipped. And on the next wee slide there, you can see some, um, some little examples of when we have used just the simple markup tool um, or taking that camera and marking up um, some, some grading, for example, taking notes, showing learners uh, that little bit emoji of me with a uh, with a pages document was me doing a webinar and the teacher said how 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 do i insert this image how do i do instant alpha well i just took a quick screenshot sent it to them and they were able to do it okay being able to communicate effectively is quite possibly one of the most important skills in life mistakes can have quite serious consequences when you communicate wrongly and i'm not just thinking about embarrassment but frustration anger disengagement i'd hate to think that any of my learners would feel isolated because they don't understand or they're unable to communicate their lack of understanding and we know that if you use a one-size-fits-all approach you will undoubtedly overlook the different personalities expectations and needs um, it's so important to appreciate those different learning needs and for example those who learn best by either reading listening or those who prefer a more hands-on approach so for pupils who have an idea but can't get on paper perhaps record audio is another incredible tool Oh, there's dictation. <laughs> so dictation is one of my top tools, which saves me a whole heap of time. Again, who says we need to type reports? We used to have to handwrite reports and now we can dictate them. Also, if the focus on your lesson is not to check a learner's handwriting, but their understanding of a task, just get them to dictate it or add an audio note. Um, there's the audio now, or even get them to use the camera to get them to create a little video like a YouTuber. And audio notes especially are especially important when kind of getting accents and pronunciation right. It's great to get learners' voices heard so you can hear that kind of intonation and tone that maybe you kind of feel from them that they're not too happy about something, really important. And also, as a teacher, if they hear your voice, which is so important right now at this time, um, they can also hear whether you're being a little bit you know, empathetic or you're being a bit more stern with them. It's a really powerful tool. Um, now more than ever, we're also seeing how collaboration is key. So making sure a project is completed successfully on time and with everyone's needs met. As the technology evolves and transforms the people work, we still need to instill these skills in our young learners. Um, and again, features like being able to invite others to collaborate in Keynote or notes or numbers and pages means that everyone that you can invite can work on a piece of work, make changes and see those changes live as they're made. And it's so simple to do. 
Again, it's that simplicity that the iPad brings to all of these tasks. So you think of a task, you think, I want to do that. Wow, the iPad can do that for me, okay? We can also use apps such as Schoolwork and Classroom to communicate, share and collaborate easily and securely. There are other third-party apps, I think I mentioned some before, so, but Shobi, Seesaw, Teams, Google Classroom, we've got Hangouts, Zooms, et cetera, a whole host. Um, I think you can see some of them on the next screen. They can also be used on the iPad to bring together our pupils, our colleagues and outside agencies. So perhaps we're using uh, an iPad, but the other person is not then you know you can export a file you can put it into word you can send it over the workspaces which can be customized the chat the calls the file sharing and uh, the meet features allow us to do just about everything we would have done before but now virtually and perhaps even a bit more effectively and efficiently i'd say but all you need to do is think a little bit differently and dare i say a bit more creatively which i think brings us on to the next little topic that michael's going to talk about possibilities and if we think about that, that, that one device it sits at the heart of really of all ecosystems you know you're, you're thinking that uh, this is a device I would want to be central to anything I want to do to any 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 kind of platform productivity suite I can do all on this this, this device um, and of course at schools are so much more than just its core curriculum and I know as a, as a senior leader we're really, and, and a leader of learning too, and teachers, we're really responsible for developing the whole person. And the question I always ask is, well, how can I work on that when they're not going to be in my building for any length of time? And I'll make no bones about my passion for uh, expressive arts and you know what it does for the soul and the heart and the mind. And I want to help our young people move on in terms of technology being used for you know constantly consuming content. I think a lot of young people are finding this lockdown a real struggle mm -hmm. and so there's only so many box sets you can watch before your brain just says you know I've had enough I need something else please go and help me um, and so what I've seen online are just some great examples of people really tapping into the creative side of themselves you know lip-syncing great speeches from history dressing up as paintings tick-tocking homework all that sort of thing um, it's been really inspiring to see them, them do those sorts of things. I'm reminded when I was about nine and I wanted to play piano, um, and I went to my teacher and I said, I'd really love to learn how to play piano, that'd be fantastic, I'm really keen to do that. And, and she said, that's great, 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 have you, have you got a piano? I said, well, no, I don't have a piano because I'm, I'm from a family of eight, <laughs> we don't have very much, we struggle with books sometimes, but um, I had that little creative spark in me that I wanted to do something, and she said, well, if you don't have a piano, I really can't help you. And I was devastated, obviously, and, and, and haven't pursued that at all. But if I had all my students to have a device that would allow them to, to explore that curiosity, that creative curiosity, and I want to know, is there a device that I can use with my students that's got as many creative tools as it possibly can? Because although I've got resources in school for, you know, all 600 of my students, lesson by lesson, I can't distribute them to all the families and children across my uh, estate. I've got great, great stuff at school, but that's not where some of the learning is going to happen. So developing a programme, perhaps a one-to-one -one programme, where every student's got access to a whole box full of creative tools would be really, really benefit, beneficial. And I'm also conscious that arts programmes and staffing are sometimes, sometimes the first things to be cut uh, way back for, for different reasons. And for example, here in Scotland, I've worked with several primary schools that don't have any formal music input um, from one week to the next, um, even as a light touch. So it's difficult to develop young people's skills and their interests. So you know what, let's enable teachers and enable young people to explore those parts of themselves that really build you up, up as a human being and, and complement the development of problem solving techniques and things like divergent thinking. So I want to have a quick look at this curriculum that everyone can create curriculum developed by Apple. Um, it's just phenomenal and really what it focuses on is it is about developing skills it's not about just you know here's buttons to press and have fun with an iPad it is actually about can I develop drawing skills using technology it leads you through lesson by lesson really really straightforward and nicely giving you examples of you know what to achieve and what it will look like when you're finished that's a great example of that tracy face exercise it's great to have access to this. And I went through the mute little music uh, platform um, just the other day there, looking at recording loops. And I don't have a musical bone in my body, really, but 
Um, I followed this lesson all the way through. It gives me nice screenshots to see what it would look like on my screen when I'm using an iPad, learning about things like tempo, whatever that is. So I've, I did a bit of this the other day there, and I'm going to let you listen, hopefully, to a little bit of one of my opuses that I've created. <laughs> this is your opportunity to shine, Michael. <laughs> How amazing is that? That that is. I think everyone's got off their seats right now. They're boogieing on. They're all, all boogieing and dancing. That's excellent. That's that's exactly what I wanted, wasn't it, everybody? Um, and as I say, it, it it didn't really take me that long to do it. And I really, really, I really enjoyed doing it. Right, really, obviously, I really enjoyed doing that and spending time noodling and and having fun. Um, and would you not rather your students were engaging in those kind of activities? The the ones that sometimes you have no real point sometimes, but other than developing the skills, having fun, creating, noodling, making something, because I find that myself being in, totally absorbed in creating something really does something for our well-being. It really takes us out of ourselves, away from some of the anxieties that surround COVID. And you want that for your students, regardless of whatever background they've come from. Lee, what's your, what's your thoughts to my, my opuses there? Yeah, so I haven't created anything, but that was that was amazing, Michael. Yeah, I agree that innovation and creativity are definitely fundamental to all educational activities and not just the arts. It's it's a critical part of making sense of life and learning experiences. And we've already talked about how important that element of personalization choices and the iPad enables this. Creative thinking is about enabling a different way of thinking, getting those neurons working so that learners can then apply their imagination, just as you did there, Michael. Um, and you, you were learning skills on the iPad, but you were actually also, you were learning how to create music, but you're also learning how to use the iPad as well. So fantastic. Um, yeah, so from here, you can generate ideas, questions, hypothesis. Creativity really promotes that idea of risk-taking, experimentation. It encourages people, to, uh, kids to evaluate your own ideas, as well as those of their peers and of others, which, which is really, really important, isn't it? And I think back to the days when I would tell my pupils that I wanted them to create, for example, I want you to do a poster in German about your town. Right, your, sub, your topic is town right now, you've got to do it, okay? And I'd have their vocab list there for them. I'd even sometimes give them a template because it would help them. And on reflection, this task was a bit too prescriptive and restrictive, right? Not maybe for all of them, but for the majority. And I know this because we tried a similar activity a topic later, and the results were far more exciting, rewarding, not to mention, you know, multidisciplinary. And it got them out and about and, you know, walking about the school and everything. So I gave what I gave my problems was uh, my pupils was a problem. How might we tell the P7 transition pupils about our school? And this was well before COVID-19, but it's particularly apt for now. They would work in groups. They would need to add, they would all need to add some content to their creations within a realistic and agreed specified time frame. Um, but the, yeah, the results were great. We did a sketch note first and the suggestions were fab. From there, the groups were agreed and each group created something different. So some went for the poster, some went for a video, just a, a normal video of you know, themselves talking to each other. Some went for a keynote, some went for iMovie using green screen, some went for clips, some went for pages docs with pictures and audio notes put in because they didn't want their photo, they didn't want their faces into it. Some even, just like you there, Michael, uh, created a garage band theme music to put into their creations as well. But each learner added something different to their team and to the project as a whole. And I was really inspired by the five elements of learning book um, that you kind of talked about right at the beginning, because I was able to use that to design a learning experience, experience which was rich. It meant that people were more engaged, involved, and they were invested in it. And I love that idea of the problem and game-based learning. And the iPad has everything you need to allow these experiences to happen. It also takes the focus off you as a teacher at the front of the class, which, although really scary and strange at first, is actually a lot more fun and sustainable as well. So, yeah, yeah. that's my kind of ode to creativity. But I think you're going to yeah. tell us about coding, because I saw a little nudge to coding there. Hang on. I'm just reflecting on, you know, when I started teaching, which wasn't yesterday, you know, if you'd said to students, <laughs> energy, go and make a podcast, or, well, first of all, what is a podcast, but, or, you know, go and make a movie, a professional-looking movie for me, please, is as a piece of assessment, it would have been impossible. And now these 
these tools are available and so easy to use. Um, it really just opens up a whole new world for them, um, as does my other kind of um, passionate kind of area. And I, I have to admit um, and hold my hands up here that I've got some skin in the game in terms of um, coding, which is what we're looking at next. Um, my background is computing science, I cannot tell a lie. Um, so I'm kind of predisposed disposed to be passionate about coding. And from a school's perspective, I know that we have to look to literacy and numeracy and health and well-being as being the backbone of how we develop a, a, a young person and develop them through their, their school career so that they can you know, successfully participate in life and learning and work, as I've said before. It's, it's just so crucial to get that right. But I'm also conscious that of a responsibility we have to prepare young people to understand how their world is built and is being built for their today and tomorrow. So when we look at artificial intelligence, machine learning, when, when we understand how Google works and that Facebook's a database, what we're beginning to do there is really to look behind the curtain of the great Oz, <laughs> which is a bit deep and meaningful. But, um, because I believe that being an active citizen really is about taking some responsibility for understanding what it is you're participating in with your eyes wide open. So the computational skills development that coding is a part of, it bleeds into so many other areas of the curriculum from the design process through implementation, through teamwork, to debugging and solving errors and things. I used to say to my English staff, you know, maybe start using some of the language like debugging to talk about how you would um, look at a, pe a young student's piece of work with their spelling mistakes and their grammar errors, talk about them as being bugs that need to be de debugged when you hand it hand it back to them. And I know obviously coding is part of the whole of the whole digital literacy agenda uh, alongside cyber resilience and internet safety. And so what we've got is a feature set developed by Apple uh, within the Swift programming language that really engages learners and connects them to real life use and why understanding and developing coding is so important. So I wanted to take a quick look at what it looks like. Um, again, back in the bookstore, which is just a, such a treasure trove for teachers and for learners, um, there's a whole area devoted there to teaching code and that everyone can code puzzle books, which will be followed um, in short order by everyone can code adventure books, they're all there. Um, we can take a young person on a journey from really early coding skills all the way through to developing their own applications with Swift, which is absolutely phenomenal. Um, so let's have a look at um, the Everyone Can Code Puzzle Book. Um, it's really, really straightforward. There's a teacher guide there, obviously, which will really support you in what it is you're trying to achieve by introducing this curriculum. Um, it uses these really nice, engaging, interesting characters to lead them through the skills development part of becoming um, a, a coding um, student. And it starts by talking about learning about a concept, trying that concept out in coding, applying it to a real problem, and then connecting that new learning to the other parts of the learning you've done before. You will need the Swift Playgrounds app on the device. Again, that's all entirely free, and that provides you with the environment to do the coding that you want to do. It does interface really well with everyone can create curriculum. So several times throughout this book, you'll be asked to connect with iMovie, photos, clips, and those kind of tools. If you just want to set up an informal coding club, you can do that with the Swift Coding Club's uh, content. that's also in Swift Playgrounds if it's not part of your computing science curriculum. The way the lessons are set up is it normally starts with what we call unplugged activities. That's activities and learning about coding without actually being near a device. And those are really important that we do that conceptually, that we take them on that journey. And then we just allow them to try some coding out. So if I go to the next um, little screen here, this is the environment. This is a Swift Playgrounds environment. As you can see on the right hand side, we've got the, I guess, the play area and where the code runs and you see the results of your code. And on the left hand side, you get a chance to uh, put your code in there. So this is a fully animated little sequence on the right hand side. This is a live environment awaiting you to add code and make things happen. Completely 3D, 360 degrees, and you can move your character about to see how what the problem is and also how you're going to solve it. To code, you don't have to type all the code in. So if you're a, if you struggle with writing, you don't have to worry about that because we just tap on the instructions 
that appeared in the bottom to build our program and our sequence of instructions. And then we get a chance, if we're happy, to run the code and we can pull out to the whole screen to see that. So let's, this little character is called Byte. Let's see how he gets on. Come on, Byte. Get the gem. Yes, get in. <laughs> You've written your first Swift code program. That's, that's amazing. And, and the feedback we get from students when they're using the Swift pro, uh, Playgrounds environment is so positive. And they really want to learn more and do more and achieve more. And that's that's something you absolutely want to tap into. Um, Apple's worked with a whole load of partners in the past and building content for coding Swift Playgrounds is so important. But even if you're doing stuff, work at early years, um, pre-reading age, there's coding environments for that through Tinker and CodeSpark that you may want to look at. And another scratch there that you can use on um, Apple's Safari uh, web browser, which is a fully functioning desktop browser. Really, really powerful. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Lee, what, what's, your, what's your view and opinion of, of coding as a whole? Yeah, so I was going to say, I love the idea of game-based learning, totally love it. And I can so totally see the benefits of it and the links to computational thinking and being cyber resilient. But I'm being devil's advocate here, Michael. What on earth or when on earth am I going to use code in, in modern languages? Like, really? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, um, I suppose I suppose apart from the the obviously it's a language, okay. So there's there's really important concepts in what you're trying to do in our own syntax and semantics that exist here as well. So if you want to communicate properly with that computer, you need to know the language properly. You know how to construct, I guess, you know, a, a programming sentence if you like in order to get it to achieve something in the same way that when you speak a language and mis mispronounce something or get the wrong masculine or feminine, then you might cause some confusion. So there's there's those language you know, connections that are obviously there, I suppose. Um, but when I, when I talk about computing science and about, about coding, is it's really a creative and collaborative endeavor, um, in my opinion, and it's really about What's an authentic purpose for coding? You can learn coding, that, that's great, but now give me a purpose to use my coding skills. So for example, say you were looking at Spanish speaking cities across the world, for example, then maybe you could get your students to use a coding platform to create um, an interactive animation that allows you to navigate a character around the world and maybe explain the culture and do all that animation through coding. Maybe you could have the character speak Spanish or allow the user who's using the program to type in English words and have the software translate it, you can do that. Or you could build a fitness app that you sell into foreign markets where students are having to maybe capture videos, explaining particular exercises using that foreign language. So it's, it's really a guess, what's an authentic reason for using the language? And we've <coughs> pardon me, already spoken about creativity. How can you leverage the, the natural creative instincts in order for them to show you what they know about languages. And it just extends the possibilities for you as a teacher, really. Yeah, no, you've sold it to me. No, I do love coding, actually. And uh, it was one of my weak spots, I would say. But uh, by going to the Apple Teacher, we're going to talk about this a bit later, but all these resources are available through Apple Teacher. And it's really great at kind of showing you and giving you ideas of how you would use it. Because um, especially, I think, in secondary, you go, well, this is my subject. That's what I teach. But you can see all these resources and go, oh, wait a minute, I could bring a bit of that into my, my lesson. It's really good. Thank you. Yeah. So I want to move on to now to critical thinking and you know developing effective learners because in this blended remote learning world we're in, I as a leader want to understand going to me what technology is going to do for me to help deliver the same set of skills and competencies that I would be asking my staff to deliver in the classroom. So when we talk to employers, we, we know what skills they want our students to have been developing. And I need, as a leader, to ensure that throughout the curriculum, they've got the opportunity to develop those kind of work-ready skills. So, for example, how can I let pupils develop teamwork skills when they're miles apart? We know that's a, a critical skill for work. How do I help them exercise critical thinking skills? What we need for our students is not to be passive receivers of information. We need them to question ideas, argue both sides, 
develop independent thought, you know, doing proper research, what research actually looks like, synthesizing different resources and pieces of information to make an evaluation. You kind of it's a systematic approach to living, really, isn't it? That's the way we want to be able to develop that, those citizenship skills there. In a fake, you know, fake news and conspiracy-oriented world, sometimes it's, it's even more critical that we arm students with those capacities that critical thinking demands. You know, and as a leader, I want students to have access to knowledge and all that there possibly can be out there. Access to ideas, to approaches, to tools to see the world from a new perspective and ways to build solutions. And especially with the remote learning um, challenges just now, if I can find a device, and I know I've got a device that we're talking about today that really will help develop all of those things. Um, so let's leverage the power of that technology to overcome things like disinformation, for example. Now, we've spoken about um, some of the books that are out there for you as for leaders and for leaders of learning. Um, Elements of Leadership is, a, is an amazing book. Um, Innovation and Skills, similarly so. I'm a big fan of Research for Educators because I really know that you really want to be able to show each other and, and your staff that actually um, technology has an impact for our learners and in our context. The Elements of Learning book is one of spent a lot of time with um, with different schools and um, colleges actually looking at critical thinking skills and looking at the, the five elements of learning and I'll just kind of walk you through some of it I suppose. Um, the book's very straightforward again no padding and anything like that it's looking at teamwork, communication creation, personalization of learning, critical thinking, reward and engagement. These are things we've already been doing for, for centuries about this these are the skills we want young people to develop. How is technology going to move those skills on in terms of teamwork and, and real world engagement and things like that. So we can begin to explore through the book in this particular section about critical thinking, what how we define critical thinking in terms of some of those skills, what, what students are engaged in when they're developing critical thinking. And there's some nice interactive elements to the book that will let you explore different lesson plans that they have out there, different ways of of evaluating how strong the activity that you provide for students is in terms of its ability to promote critical thinking. Um, so across those five areas, for example, you know your solution generation, do you have enough tools at your disposal to produce a solution to a complex problem? Well, you absolutely do it on an iPad. Um, so there's example lessons in there where iPad really helps to elevate the high order thinking skills including synthesis across a whole range of sources that you've compiled from the research you can do online, the books you pull from the bookstore. So there's new ways of engaging in, in real world authentic tasks, real world applications. So, you know, don't make a poster and stick it on a classroom wall. There's little risk there for students and it doesn't have that real world engagement. And I'm not saying, you know, stop doing posters. Absolutely not. It's let's extend the range of how young people output what they know give them a little bit of a risky situation where they have to polish a little bit deeper, go create a campaign video and publish it online, go and create a podcast that captures different parts of the debate about maybe, I don't know, the authenticity of Shakespeare's plays, for example. When you've got an iPad in that kind of situation, you really can move children on in these developing these skills, whether they're at home or at school. Um, and that's really, really important that we, we are able to do that. Lee, what, what, what's your think, feelings around this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So definitely don't don't diss the posters. Love the posters, but it is again about pushing our kids on to maybe then taking that idea, that original thought, and then you know creating something different. And that's where critical thinking, creativity really come into uh, their own. But I've also had great success in my classes, for example, using the native apps on the iPad to create engaging activities, which that encourage that analytical kind of critical thinking. For example, just a simple activity I can think of off the top of my head is using maps. So how do I get from Glasgow to Paris? We're going to Paris tomorrow, how do I get there? And they have to figure out how to do it and then they can use the iPad to make their thinking visible, to take a screen recording of that or you know, demonstrate it using clips or you know, any of those tools. And it's just using the iPad again as a tool to showcase this skill. Um, and yeah, so airdropping that to me, using Classroom, using Split View, using Audio Notes, Dictation, iCloud Collaboration, all that. These have all allowed me to kind of work with my classes for them to work together. 
it's also saved us a whole heap of time and effort as well as paper posters are great but they take a lot of paper as well um and but i think that leads us into productivity and how ipad enables us to be more productive with our time and use less paper absolutely um and, and as a leader in school you know that, that workload is a common issue for staff and has been for you know 20 years or, or maybe more um i mean look, you can often ask you know what's changed in 20 years in terms of my workload um to improve it you might well think that you know nothing's been done to improve it and if if I look at technology as a leader, and I've, I've had conversations like this with some senior leaders, if I'm going to look to technology and invest in it, what am I getting back? My response to that is, you know, you're not investing in technology, you're investing in your staff, you're investing in your students and in their families and in their future. And I've spoken about how iPad delivers some amazing key productivity uh, tools you know, across Keynote. And, you know, Lee and I developed this presentation collaboratively on Keynote. Um, just over the last week or so, um, but there's also those other suites from other other places, um, and applications like Seesaw and Showbe have been a real lifeline to schools and to teachers as they've been doing some remote learning. Um, I know some staff feel a bit of Ill, Ill at ease that people's having their own device that you know they'll be playing games and watching YouTube and you know how can I utilise it for my benefit to reduce my workload well. XMA can help you with that absolutely um, and look at those kind of issues and how the devices are managed and things like that and when we're back in the classroom I really want to show teachers and leaders of learning how the iPad can give teachers much more flexibility in delivering the learning to students and empowering them as leaders of learning in the classroom so if we just have a look at Apple Classroom for example um, we'll also look at schoolwork in just a second so it's ability for the teacher to be able to see their entire class and manage a sense of all of their iPads in the classroom. So from your iPad, you can set up your class and the students have their own iPad and they join into your class. And now you can see them all. You can see all of the devices and you can see everything that they're doing on their iPad. You can see what app they're in, for example. It's really, really easy to distribute content to them. No longer walking about the class handing out worksheets. You just swipe over piece of content to your class and both it's all there on their iPad straight away. Similarly, if you've got students who maybe struggle with typing and you want to share a website with them, just drag that website um, address over to the class and it will open up that website and all the students' devices at the same time. I absolutely love that. And then you've got the ability to look at an application to push that application to open on their device and keep them locked into that application and focused on that and not be distracted. So you've really got an awful lot of power there. I can see everything that the students are doing, each individual student, what are they up to? And then I can I can look in, I can view the screen of that particular individual student. Maybe they need some help. Can I see what progress they're making? Teachers love that. If you've got an Apple TV, then you can use, if you're using a MacBook or an iPad, you can use Apple TV in order to share that content that's on their devices to a larger screen for peer review and peer assessment. Really nice critical stuff we want to be able to do as, as exercises in learning and teaching. Um, and then a lot of teachers really like the fact that they can lock all the children's iPads at one time. Let's get the focus off the device and onto me because I'm the teacher here in the classroom. I can then analyze what students have been doing uh, on their devices, how they've spent their time um, across those different apps. So what we really have there with the, the classroom app, for example, is a real, really nice way of you cutting down time and some dead time that happen in the classroom. It's really, really efficient at moving and distributing content and getting children focused on their learning. Um, what about yourself, um, Lee? Yeah, I absolutely love classroom. I've been using it as well as demonstrating how to use it for quite some time now, and it keeps getting better. I love the fact that you can drag and drop you know from a, a website into a pupil or to a class whether you use classroom ad hoc or pre-configured on a one-to-one -one or a shared ipad it really is your kind of second pair of eyes and your virtual learning assistant but i do always emphasize that classroom is not a behavior management tool and it should be used in a positive way it's, it's meant to be there to encourage you know kind of sharing communication collaboration 
but it's also very effective at getting your class attention, I must say, and um, being able to mute them and lock them in hiding apps. I love the lock feature. Um, it's just like getting them to put their pencils down, face the front again, you know. Schoolwork, though, I see you're looking at here, is what you would have kind of used in the old world, word, inverted commas, um, along with Classroom. It's another powerful app which helps teachers and learners use the iPad even more effectively. So it would have been kind of what you would have used kind of out of class. It, to me, it's kind of a hub in which teachers can easily distribute and collect assignments. You can monitor people progress in educational apps like Tinker, Nearpod, Kahoot, Swift Playgrounds, etc. Et There's a whole host of apps you can use. And you can also collaborate one-to-one -one with students from anywhere. So not necessarily in class, and it's in real time as well. It's easy for both teachers and learners to use due to its very intuitive nature. That's why we love the iPad. Um, and you can create announcements and assignments really easily. Um, assignments using almost any type of content. So you can be distributing PDFs to a specific app and it will automatically appear on your pupil's device. They're organized by due date and class, um, and it really helps teachers give feedback, which is so important, that rich, deep, meaningful feedback. It helps you monitor and track pupils to allow for that, those kind of recap tasks, to allow for differentiated learner learning, and if need be, those conversations about how best to meet the needs of you know, all your learners. As with all Apple products, there we go, there's how to give that, that's that voice note again. As with all Apple products, Privacy and security features are built in so schools get to create their own and control their own accounts used by their pupils and they get to decide when to share um, and who to share that information with. And it's available in the App Store. Um, it does require a setup of school accounts and classes in Apple School Manager by whoever's in charge of the infrastructure. But the new design, Schoolwork 2, it looks fabulous. The best way really to see it, uh, to see what it does, is really to try it out and we can maybe help you with that. Yeah, learning. Yeah, excellent. I'm really planning to help you on that journey of getting it into the shape that you need it to be. Um, yeah. Professional learning then, you know, all of the things we've shown you there, it's really, really important that we invest in our staff so that they can leverage the very best out of it. You know, that's, that's really critically important to me. Staff have already been working in a really agile way, taking on that kind of learning from them, for themselves. But we know that if we don't pay attention to professional learning, we'll not get the benefits, the, the kind of things we've been talking about here. iPads don't teach children, teachers teach children. But when you've got a confident practitioner who's been well supported in their professional development, who knows not just the how of an iPad, but also the why of an iPad, and even more importantly, I guess, the when to use the iPad, what you've got is a supercharged classroom right there, whether it's right there in the actual physical building of the school or at home. And if we help teachers lean in and use the enthusiasm for technology that young people have, and we lean in and give them the support they need to, to, to leverage that, you're going to get a massive amount of benefit from there. And when you work with us here at XMA, we'll help you through every stage of that ambition. Um, Lee, for you, you know, as a teacher and a manager of staff, for example, what's your, your understanding here? Yeah, so right at the start, uh, I think we've kind of done a full circle. I believe that that kind of idea of encouraging that resilience and growth in our staff, as well as our pupils, we have to provide tools so that everyone can embrace this kind of, this change essentially, but they can embrace it with positive mindset and a can-do approach. Um, if your staff feel like you're investing time and effort in, the, in them, then they will feel empowered and encouraged and more willing to take on new challenges. We, we're doing this with our pupils, we need to do this with our staff as well. So a clear vision which has realistic yet ambitious milestones, strong leadership and a strategy which everyone invests in is, I just feel it's so critical. And as an Apple professional learning specialist, we are all teachers. So all of us at XMA here are, um, are teachers. We've got the knowledge and understanding of how educational establishments work. Um, and we have the positive outcomes of all the learners at heart really. So we support teachers and learners on small and large scale deployments. Uh, currently in a very large scale deployment at the moment, uh, but we use that bespoke coaching and mentoring model and we can uh, offer hands-on sessions held at your school, college or university. Um, they're tailor-made um, and we practice what we preach, as it were, so in our sessions they mirror great learning experiences from the elements of learning. Um, we, we show all these tools and we really facilitate um, sessions. Um, and during these more surreal times, we also offer virtual APL, which is again tailor-made it's customer specific, it's responsive, and it really allows for that embedded discussion and feedback. So yeah, um, but yeah, Apple Teacher is another place which we really encourage 
our teachers to go to. It's an amazing, amazing tool. I think, Michael, you're going to speak a little bit more about it, are you? Or am yeah, I? But, you know, you don't <laughs> We've got one leave, minute. <laughs> we don't, don't want to leave teachers um, without the ability to ch take charge of their own journey through that learning. And the Apple Teacher Programme really provides you with such a strong foundation of knowledge around how to use the iPad. And you get this great accreditation about becoming an Apple teacher. It's a really straightforward journey. You choose a pathway through learning. We give you some teaching, some skills. You take the quiz, and then you earn that badge. You get the recognition that you've invested in learning about iPad and making it work for yourself and for your learners. Just to finish off, then XMA professional learning really is at the heart of what we know will improve the outcomes for you in your schools. Um, going forward with iPad at home and in the building um, across the different communities that you have. That's leaders like yourselves, teachers, students, technical support. We build a, a really strong ecosystem around supporting you moving forward and integrating that into technology. If you are interested in finding out more, I can see we've got no questions, which is probably quite useful. <laughs> We're really happy to help um, you achieve what you want to achieve with this platform. Um, so please don't hesitate to contact us, even if it's just to say, could you go into a little bit more depth in this particular area for a particular upcoming webinar? But I want to thank you for taking some time with us this afternoon to explore the why of iPad. Um, for us, you know, XMA, we understand and see every day the impact it can have on transforming learning and teaching. And especially in this current environment, we really think it is a solution that you should be spending a lot of time looking at. So thank you very much, Lee. I don't know if you've got anything to finish off. There's a poll on the screen for you. If you'd like to complete no. that as we finish off, Lee, do you have anything else to say? No, I just think sometimes it's you just don't know what you don't know. So if you want to have that conversation with us, you know, we can show you some of the tools. Hopefully this session is giving you a little bit of a flavour of what we know about. And you can ask for, yeah, as Michael said, just some more information about any of these things we've talked about. There's so much to talk about. We could talk for hours and hours, but we'll not because it's almost dinner time. Almost dinner time. <laughs> Uh, we, we can offer a two-hour leadership seminar run virtually for you if that's something you'd be interested in taking up. There's some handouts, as I said at the beginning, that you might want to take away with you uh, today. Uh, but just to finish off, thank you once again for spending some time with us. And please stay safe, stay well. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. You saying bye, Michael? Oh, I did say bye. -bye. <laughs> <laughs>